Clark. Not only went through his baptism, but ours and life thereafter. That's what we're looking for. Being connected. That's a popular phrase. And it's been in the news a lot, uh, always. Because people who get in positions of power, whatever it is, in a company, in a, in a sport, in an activity, in a school classroom, in a government, in a national, whatever, the higher you go, the more resources you have, the more you have this desire to share that with your near nuclear and, and extended family. You know, so they, they have terms for folks who, who hire family members to work for them or make sure that their family members get uh, some very special jobs with very special incomes. And uh, sometimes they earn it. Sometimes they don't, uh, and it's well, you've been paying attention over the years and years. Uh, you know, it happens a lot, but they're connected because the people that hire them or do they they want this connection to the person in power, connected power, and and it's marketable. Sometimes it's it's hard to change <coughs> this, uh, uh, and the terms just right the end, but uh, free. Selling your, your authority, selling your power. Is, uh, uh, term just went right to my head. What is it? Well, patron is the other one, but the other one when you when you get uh, uh, when you're selling your, your authority, you're coming, you know, to you say you, you, you pay play and uh, not ever is Oh, I'm not here. Like, there's so many different things. <laughs> but it, it's a uh, selling or come on here. What am I looking for? No, it's not. It's all bribery. Depends on who you're trying to bribe. It's uh, selling your authority. Uh, what? Wavy? No, not wavy. Oh, I, anyway, <laughs> people in authority like to use their place, and, and they give it, you know, and they, 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 they sometimes get it to their, uh, uh, to their children, to their siblings, to their parents, to their boys, and it's, uh, but connected, being connected, uh, sometimes it's helpful. I mean, for all that the human resources does today, to, to digitize it so that, if you have a job opening, uh, you just learn how to, to plug in the qualifications for it and, and fill in the blanks, go online, and then there are several services that you fill in the blanks, you give it to them, and in, in, in an instant, they have computed it all and they give you back more people than you could interview personally, but uh, you get the parent down to work for it. And it's, it's uh, so human resources. But you know, even with all of that computerization of it and do it, it's still I think and understand that there's a lot of, of importance to who you know, who you're connected to. Because being connected to someone in the whatever organization it is that you're uh, trying to become a part of, or whether it's a school or a business or a government position, if you know somebody, you can get in. That's what they do internship programs do uh, uh, in, in colleges these days, is it gives you an opportunity to, uh, uh, one, on-the-job training, but two, it gives you an opportunity to get connected with somebody, and if you really click in your internship with someone, it makes it a whole lot easier for you to, if not work in the same business, then in a similar with a great reference from the person that you connected with. So it's still a matter of connections and, and references. Well, in this context of church, connectivity is important because if you're not connected, you're going to die eternally. Well, that's the present way of saying you're going to hell. Pure and simple. So the, the, the task is to get connected. And how do we get connected? You know, 
our connectivity, our, the connectivity right is holy baptism, baptismal font. That's the public right of our connectivity to God. That's the system, that's the process, that's the, the, the rigmarole that we go through. Because God says, do this. And he, but it's still not something that we are doing. God says, this is how I've got it set up. Do this. Do this for yourself. Do this for your children. Do this. Do this. Because I do stuff through this process. This is how I feed. This is called the means of grace. The ways in which God gives us his blessings. The gracious blessings that we don't deserve, but he gives us to us anyway. Rather than giving us what we do deserve, which is eternal damnation and immediate hellfire brimstone. It's not in comparison to other people. It's not in comparison to other good people or really bad people. It's in comparison to God and, and His holiness and His righteousness and His requirement that if we want to be with Him, we have to be perfect. Well, the process that He set up is, is baptism. Baptism was a part of the Old Testament. Except all the way through John, Jesus' cousin, it was a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. There's still some concept of that, but in the Old Testament, it was a forerunner of the baptism that we have now. Just as the sacrifices in the Old Testament were a forerunner of sacrifices this day as a Christian. But the, for, but the sacrifices of the Old Testament was an object lesson that says basically, God says, I want to forgive you. And I have a way that you're going to be forgiven all of your sins. It hasn't happened yet, but it will. And, and this is a reminder that, that the sacrifice that says, I want to forgive you. And they get all wrapped up in the process of forgiveness, of, of the process of the sacrifices, and they miss the point. God says, I, I really don't want sacrifices. I want a contrite heart. I want a repentant heart. And that's what you know, John preached, uh, John the baptizer preached to people in his day that says, baptism, repent of your sin, prepare the way of the coming of the Lord. Still the same sermon, still the same text, except that we're preparing for a second coming. And the kind of thing we just had in the hymn, Luther's hymn, is that it's our job to invite other people to join us to be waiting for Christ, to be connected to Christ. Now, if you aren't ready, to be connected either by word and or by sacrament. You don't have to be baptized in order to go to heaven. You don't have to be connected. We're connected by the Holy Spirit and by our word. God calls us through the gospel. The Holy Spirit enlightens us with his gifts. Gathers and keeps us. When we talk about the work of the Holy Spirit, we really talk about that much of uh, baptism is a part of it. Because he's the important part of what makes baptism work. Now, when John came to Jesus, when Jesus came to John to be baptized, this was cousin. We talked about last year. Jesus was uh, last week. Jesus is the perfect child, right? John knew that. John knew all the razzing that Jesus got for being perfect, doing everything right, doing nothing wrong, doing everything he's supposed to do when he's supposed to do it. You know, one of those. One of those guys. You know, keeping me away from. It. Okay. So when Jesus comes to John to be for a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, John's not a dummy. He says, hey, excuse me, uh, God, listen, I need to be baptized by you. What are you talking about? You, you have nothing. You're, you're innocent. You're righteous. You're holy. You're perfect. This is a baptism of repentance. You have nothing to repent of. And Jesus said, yeah, Dad's got this other plan for you. And uh, we've got to do this now because it's part of the program. Part of the process. You don't understand. And you don't need to now. This is 
this is all going to be done after you're dead and gone. And Jesus did say that. But we can't. We can't. And Jesus was right, of course. It didn't happen until John was long beheaded and dead and already uh, with Jesus in heaven. It's one of those eternity, time, eternity, or all that, whatever. Anyway. And John consents and baptizes Jesus. Why? Because what is Jesus' baptism all about? That's what the writer of Romans, probably Paul, tells us about. That's why Christ's baptism. Because Christ had a baptism of repentance for forgiveness of sins. Not for his sin, but for all of us. For all of humanity. That's what he came to do, is to save the world from their sins. And so the first thing as he begins his public ministry is to receive a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And that's so it starts out off the bat. You know, this is how God has, has fixed this for you, that the people of God, and so many others who have heard it and, and came to become God-fearers even through the people of God. God set it forth. He said, this is how it's and it wasn't completed until on the cross Jesus says, it is finished. But even then there was more <coughs> to happen. To happen. Because see, it says, and that's what, but the baptism that John gave to Jesus was not for Jesus, it was for us. Because Jesus was taking us with him in the Jordan River to be baptized. Because what happens is, is that now by doing that, as explained in, in the Romans text today, our baptisms are joined with Christ's baptism. So we are joined with Christ in his baptism, in his perfect life, in his suffering, in his death. We are with Christ. So that when Jesus died on the cross and said, it is finished, then he has accomplished all that was necessary for all humanity to receive forgiveness of, he died for the sins of all. The sins of everyone are forgiven by God. But God says, in order for that to happen, what happened is I sent my only begotten son to take your place, not your place, to take your place and live for you and die for you on the cross. And our baptism then joins us to him as he went through those processes for us and died for you and for me. <laughs> he died for us. Died for and, and took our place. So he joins us. But not only does he join us to his baptism, to his life, and to his death, but he also joins us to his burial. Because there's a lot of time trying to help us. We are now, by Christ, we are dead to sin. You know what it is? To be dead. You can't do anything. You cannot respond. You cannot do anything positively. You can't do anything negative. You can't, you know, it's, it's, it's over. And that's the example, that's the process that God says, that's how you consider yourself. I think one of the, the, the last words of the epistle lesson this morning. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God. Dead to sin. You can't do anything anyway about making God love you or give you more of his grace or more of his, you know, you can't. Uh, he opened it up and said, said, we are free from the law. We are free to do whatever we want to. And he says, so does that mean we go out and sin boldly, just sin, sin, sin more and more, so that God's grace is showered upon us even more and forgive us? And he says, 
No. <laughs> the translation would be, you know, the usual. No. <laughs> no. You don't do that. See? Because as God's children, baptized or not yet so, but as God's children, he says, consider yourselves dead to sin. Which means you don't have to pay attention to the temptation to sin. You don't have to pay attention to that. You ask God to redirect your thinking into the scriptures so that you do the things that God wants. He said, the commandments are not there to say, thou shalt, thou shalt not, or you will go to hell. It says, here's what we do. Here's how you can live. And there's an expectation that in Jesus' name, with Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, that we do those things. As we went through, you notice all the things uh, 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 that the whole the Trinity is all involved. Open words of Isaiah chapter 42. Behold, my Father, servant, Christ, his son, whom I call my chosen, that's the same word as the anointed one, the appointed one, which is the word translated in Hebrew is, is Messiah. In Greek is Christos, Christ. He is the appointed, the chosen one, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. This is the Old Testament. The Father, his Son, and the Holy Spirit. Together. Together. And then through Isaiah, from the very beginning, he begins to, to point out all kinds of things as to how Jesus is going to be different. They were looking for a Messiah, but they were looking for a slash and burn of their enemies and all that in the way and, and, and take care of hunger and, and uh, disease and, and famine and all that stuff. And all sorts of stuff. Just, you know, slash and burn and take and fix and do everything. And he is going to do that when the Messiah comes back again. But the first time, and this is what Isaiah did. You, Isaiah predicted that. He says, he will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break. A fam faintly burning wick, and so forth. So he, he is not coming as he is coming gent gentleness. He is coming, he's not raising his voice. He's not stopping. He's not few of the miracles as he explained, as he did that, as he cast out the demon. That was some violence there. But as he helps those in advance, one, to help them, and two, as a demonstration that he is God in the flesh. God with us. But he didn't, he didn't rebel against you know, his little conversation with Pilate. So he says, oh, so yes, I am a king. But my kingdom is not of this world. If it was, my legions of angels. I don't understand what he means. Rome legions. And he had no idea what he were up against the legions of angels when it only takes one. And if I don't know. But Jesus came to give us, to do these things that were given to us. And, and he gives it. And, and then Isaiah continues. It says, God the Lord created the heavens and earth, stretched out so it gives breath to the people. So I am the Lord, I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you a covenant for the people, a light for the nations, to open the eyes of the blind, blind to his word, not true blindness, blind to his word. I, I will to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon. The dungeons of hell, of darkness, and the depredation of, of sin. From the prison, those who sit in darkness, in, in, in the darkness of sin, in the darkness of the dark places of the earth, and the dark ways of, of drug addiction, and homelessness, and abuses, and all sorts of stuff. And he said, We are, I am the Lord, that is my name, my glory I give to no other, nor praise. Behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things I now declare before they spring forth. I tell you of them now. In Isaiah's time. All this was foretold by the prophets of the Old Testament. When Jesus came and fulfilled it, baptized by John, by joining us, our baptism, to Christ's baptism. And so if you follow the, the prepositions in the, in the epistle lesson today, uh, 
Uh, we were buried, therefore, with him, Jesus Christ, by baptism and death. Uh, and that, uh, uh, verse 6, we know that our old self was crucified with him. And then, the next verse, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin, for the one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. And this is not just living eternally, this is living now with him. For the death he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God, so that you also must consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. That's the miracle. Is that as Christians, as children of God, our desire is to live the servant life that Christ did. To serve other people with love. To serve other people with the resources, serving our own, with the resources that God has given us to serve them in love, to take care of them. And seeking by the power of the Holy Spirit that God has given us as a down payment on our inheritance of eternal life in the kingdom of God, we talked about last week. That inheritance, the, down, the Holy Spirit is with us, still working with us. <laughs> To help us walk in light as children of light. To shine in the darkest places. That's the way God set things up. We are the body of Christ today. We are his instrument in shining his light in the darkness of people's lives and in the world. Not to our glory, but to his glory. Because in so doing, it furthers his kingdom so that the body of Christ on earth grows and gathers and enlightens and keeps. Because it's not us, it's the Holy Spirit that's doing all of those things. Until Jesus comes and all those connections are confirmed as he says to those connected to him by baptism, by word, and holy communion, by faith, by trust. Time to come from here to be in heaven in the perfect life forever. That's his promise. He got all his promise.